We had her on Hoopsology previously. We welcome back Sarah Jane Gamelli of Boss Life and the Celtics Block. Welcome back, Sarah. Thank you, Justin and Matt. Thanks for having me. How you guys doing? Doing really well. Really excited for this weekend. Lots of basketball to discuss with you. Um, as we, you know, trying to set up this podcast, I was kind of looking for topics, and it was kind of hard to like kind of <laughs> center on what to talk to you about first. So um, I think I settled on the women's tournament. So let's get into that first. So. As a recording of this podcast, you'll probably know who's won March Madness. So probably give you more of an overview of your overall feelings on a tournament. So we have the women's final four, Iowa, UConn, North Carolina State, and South Carolina. What has been your overall impressions of this tournament? Has it lived up to your expectations or not? What have you seen? What stood out to you? I mean, obviously, we have the usual suspects, Kaylin Clark, Paige Buckers, Juju Watkins. But is anything under the radar surface that has surprised you by any chance of the women's tournament? Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I love March Madness. And I think as a whole, it's a great way to see, you know, so much talent. Um, I mean, obviously, it's very hard for us to watch 64 games you know, the men's and the women's, but you get to see everything kind of at a larger scale. And I think covering women's basketball this year, I said, oh my gosh, it's going to be a movie. Um, because yes, Caitlin Clark is so talented. Um, but really we got to see as a scale, like you said, Juju Watkins, Paige Becker's come back, Hannah Hidalgo. Like we see these names are just coming up, especially freshmen. So it, it's been really refreshing to see that. I, I think, you know, there were there were a couple of upsets, you know, a couple of them. I know my bracket's kind of busted, but, um, you know, I, I I think the the LSU-Iowa game was just scratching the surface of the potential of what this sport can be. And when you see, you know, 12 million people tuning in uh, to a game, it really magnifies, you know, how much people really love women's basketball, you know, how much they gravitate to it. Um, as far as surprises go, I mean, I wouldn't say there were too many like first round um, upsets in that. Um, I was definitely surprised with NC State. I've been following them all year. Um, did not did not see them really beating Stanford and Tara Vanderveer and Cameron Brink. I did not see that coming. But again, it's it's March and anything can happen. And this is the biggest stage. And I think the difference between professional basketball and college is these athletes, they're putting themselves all out there. They're they're hopping over tables or diving for balls. Even when I was at games, I mean, they're just playing raw basketball. And it's great to see that uh, for the women. It's great to see the coverage. And um, I, I guess I'm going to talk about, I guess, my predictions with my heart and stay away from, from the betting side. <laughs> okay. You mentioned scratching the service surface of the potential of the popularity of the, the women's game. Can you kind of delve in that um, a little bit more? Because I think Matt and I, we started our, our podcast in 2020. This is something, a point of discussion that we have dis talked about in terms of, I would say, ESPN being the center of basketball coverage and seeing kind of an increase since the beginning of the pandemic to where we're at now. Um, where do you think the next progression of just bringing the women's game into a, a broader light? Because, you know, I watch NBA today. They're showing highlights of the, the women's tournament. But yet, I you know, where is kind of the, the WNBA today? Where is kind of that coverage? They have ESPN+. Plus. There's certainly avenues for additional programming. Where do you see that going the next level in terms of this coverage of the women's game, specifically on a broadcast side? Yeah. I mean, as far as scratching, you know, the surface, it's just showing, and this is kind of ties into one, really the amount of talent that's out there. Um, like I said, we, we, as a society, we kind of focus on one player, which, you know, I got to say, Caitlin Clark, she hoops, she's a hooper and she's going to change the game forever. But I really do think it's the generational talents, you know, like her and the Juju Watkins and the Paige Beckers, but it's also the other talent that's you know, coming into light and the evolution of the game, as far as where the game is going, I mean, women's basketball and March Madness has helped. It's capitalizing off NCAA double, double popularity. I've seen the commissioner talk about this, and it really comes down to the media rights deal. And I believe that the NBA or the WNBA is due, I think, in 2025, but it's really the media rights deal. I think that's what's going to get it forward. I think, yes, Caitlin Clark is, you know, 
helping it grow. But a lot of people forget all the talent that was there before, right? All, all the superstars that came became before her. So when you think of things like Sabrina and what she did against Steph, just highlighting these women on a bigger stage and just getting them on like an ESPN or Fox Sports or something, that that's what needs to be done for women's basketball. And, and the fact that people are, I think, more excited and uh, the ticket prices are actually more expensive for the women's Final Four than the men's, that should say something a lot about the talent. And, you know, no matter who you are, hooping is hooping. And it's nice to see people recognize that and that being put onto a light. So in a sense, you know, is the WNBA, is women's basketball where it needs to be? No. Um, and, and I'll talk about this in betting. I mean, there's just not the same betting guidelines as men and women, but it's certainly on its way. And it, it's very exciting to see. Counterpoint to that, Sarah, you know, you have this kind of like, perfect story wrapping up with Caitlin Clark. You have all these factors that make the LSU versus Iowa game so compelling. Caitlin Clark also being the all-time leading college basketball scorer, period. Any uh, maybe just eventuality that, that that narrative was so perfect, you may see a little bit of a rating step back next season. Um, y- you know, I, I think it's hard to beat any player. Uh, that that has that reach how many accolades, right? I mean, the all-time leading score. I mean, it, it's in in a sense, you know, it, it's hard to, I don't think anyone's going to reach that next year. But I think, I don't think it's going to regress. I think as mm. the media kind of continues to shine light on the Hannah Hidalgo's and the Paige Beckers and uh, the Juju Watkins, you're going to see people probably break her records. Um, I think you're going to see these generational talents you know, kind of come to light. And I'm just only naming a few women, but yeah, I mean, you know, maybe it wasn't the Caitlin Clark effect because we saw what that did to just the entire world this year. But, you know, I really have high hopes that there's just as much talent out there. Obviously, Caitlin is a very special player and you can't, um, you can't clone that. But you would only hope that there's somebody next year that's going to be setting records after records after records and that we can just kind of tune into that for both men's and women's basketball. Yeah, I think I I see like a lot of optimism, which is good to see. But I I know looking on the other side, too, even when men's college basketball was closer to its peak, uh, like like when Justin and I were growing up together and and players were still staying around and building narratives in the college game for a while. Mm -hmm. Even then, you would see lulls depending on those upcoming draft classes and and who was there. So I don't know, I guess my, my natural inclination is kind of like manage expectations. This was like a really big year for women's basketball, which is great. Um, but for myself personally, <laughs> I, I would not be shocked to see things take a little step back yeah. and that's just kind of the nature of how things go with, college sports with these short-term athletes that then, you know, eventually the stars certainly move on to the pros. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I don't, I don't disagree with that. I think it's really going to depend on, I mean, when you look at Caitlin Clark, there wasn't a lot of media press on her really until her, her like go, heading into her senior year. So yeah. it's like, there's going to be somebody out there. They may not do the same thing as Caitlin Clark. We're going to be talking about this for God. People were still talking about Pete Maravich for, for, decades you know we're always going to be talking about about this it, it's special you can't repeat it um and, and nobody's going to be her but you hope that somebody is out there you know going not taking the place but you know gonna gonna rise up in the game both both on women's and men's side it's it's good for the game on either side you know and that's what makes makes march men is great nobody likes like a boring season where you know if you've noticed in the NBA, the draft classes have been more like overseas and like G League. And I, I think over the years, the, the talent pool has just been just not, not saying that great, but just lesser than what it was in its prime, you know? So um, it's hard to say. I mean, I have optimism, but I mean, again, nobody can, can repeat what Clark did this year for sure. It was crazy. Oh, t- totally agree. And and well said. And, and I think um, we're seeing... I think, and Justin and I have talked about this too, just like the long-term effects of what 
the one and done ruling, you know, whether folks agree with it or not, in terms of building up narratives in the college game, seems to have really, really hampered the men's side of college basketball. Yeah. And uh, no, I, I agree with that. And um, I think it's even happening in women's now. Uh, Haley mm. Van Wyth, you know, she went to True. LSU, wanted to win a championship and announced today that she's in the transfer portal. Um, you see a lot of these players just one and done. And I, I personally love the feel of staying for four years, right? Like Me too. building your history in college basketball, learning, you know, just developing your skills and then moving on to the pro. That's just me. I've never been a fan of one and done. I mean, obviously LeBron was a, a talent in high school, never had to go to college, you know, proved himself, but I'm just, I'm just not really a fan of that. I, I just like the whole college experience and it's cool to see players like, um, you know, Paige backers come back who had like injuries and just really cool to see that. It's so, kind of like this transitory time too, where you get to, you have this like special period of time where you watch that player grow in these younger years where we're all naturally going to make more mistakes at those ages. <laughs> right. And, and then you see how their career evolves. I don't, my mind always goes to watching yep. Shane Battier at Duke <laughs> and, and he stayed like all four years and then yeah. seeing how his pro career went. I don't know that, that whole I thing know. was just really interesting. Cause he was like star stud on campus at Duke. And then like yeah. this, really smart, intelligent role player, but he was not never like a takeover player like in college. So I kind of, I miss some of that, I guess. I don't know. I'm getting nostalgic here. <laughs> no, no. I, and speaking of Duke, I mean, you look at like, uh, I don't know how long Kyrie was there, but like Jason Tatum, he was there for one year and then peace out. It's like, he always says he's forever indebted to Duke, but I'm like, I don't even remember him playing at Duke. You know? right. so, <laughs> no, same. I think Kyrie was there for half a season. Was he? Yeah. It was, was a, it was a short time. Part. Yeah. Unfortunately. Oh. Um, just want to ask you, you mentioned the transfer portal. So do you think that's a positive or a negative in terms of college sports? Seeing a lot of athletes take advantage of that. What are your opinions? Uh, my inkling is that you, you might be with Haley. Well, you mentioned with Haley just uh, entering a transfer portal. Is, is that a harmful in terms of players not sticking it out longer? Um, I think it'd be, it can be a great thing and a bad thing. Thing, right there's always pros and cons and you've seen like Don Staley of South Carolina you know they had a whole completely different starting five and they killed it in the recruitment level and the transfer portal and you're getting even UConn a couple of people um but in Haley's case you know she she's a hooper and she averaged like 19 20 points a game at Louisville and I think it really hurt her and she was projected to go to the the WNBA so I I knew just being on a team that talented, you're going to have to sacrifice, um, play a different role. And and I think at the end of the day, it can hurt that player. Um, I think some people chase the rings and they forget. I'm not saying this is her, but they forget, you know, kind of who they are. And it, it, it could, it could potentially hurt players. And then I've seen uh, other people in men's and women's that it's worked out for them. Right. We've seen tons of, transfers um but also for the coach like developing chemistry with a coach it's hard it's hard to just go to a program do a one and done and then transfer out um but yeah and i think in that case she you know kind of regressed and now she has to kind of you know get her stats back up right and and kind of raise her draft stock so that was kind of unfortunate to see that but um i hope the best for her she she's a hooper and um hopefully she'll make the best decision that's good for her and can finish off in one area you know um, the men's game, real quickly, uh, yep. what are your thoughts on that? UConn's been super duper. Um, do you see any chance of them being taken out? Um, any other things that stand out? Certainly, we used to see Alabama on the football side being dominant, but not on the basketball side of things. So uh, what, are your, what are your feelings of the men's tournament? Well, I don't know if you guys know this, but I went to UConn. So I'm going to try not to be biased, all right? Um, and I do this every year. Like even um, last year, I did not pick the men to win because they were, I think they were what, a five seed last year. And I just didn't think they had a mit had it in them. But honestly, watching the men this year, it's really hard for me to say that. I, I mean, maybe just as my own like interpretation, but their point differential, the way they're blowing teams out is just insane. Like I've been to all the rounds so far, uh, the Northwestern game, 
uh, Stetson. I mean, it's just no comparison. Donovan Klingon has been the ac- absolute X factor in that team. You have one of the best offenses, and then defensively, they're just insane. They have guards that are able to get to the basket. They have guards that are peri- perimeter defenders. Um, Dan Hurley, he he bleeds blue. They they love basketball, and you know, not to say Alabama can't knock them off. Alabama is a very very good offensive team. Um, and it would have to take UConn a lot to break down defensively. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's March. Anything can happen, right? I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, UConn's going to win this whole thing. But um, it, it really, it's kind of scary how much they're kind of blowing out teams. Um, but again, you can't be too confident. Um, you know, you got to keep your poise and produce kind of right there. And they they have a very, very talented team. And um, I, I think all four of these teams are have a shot, honestly. Yeah, really impressive how their program just bounced back. I mean, I mean, they made smart coaching hires and have been able to sustain. I mean, ever since Jim Calhoun retired and stepped away, you know, you kind of thought that might be the point. You have this guy who has been had such a long tenure at that university, and now he's going. You know, they're they're hanging on and keeping that legacy going. Yeah, and it's cool too to see that the, the women's side, I mean, they, they have that chance for the double title, which would be uh, very Crazy. astounding. <laughs> Same with NC state too. I mean, um, you made a good point about Jim Calhoun. Um, I think Kevin Ollie came in and, you know, we, a lot of people forget we were out of the tournament for, I think four years, four or five years yeah. uh, due to some kind of illegal recruiting or something, but it, it's nice to see the program back to where it is, you know, whether we win or not, it, it's such a talented team and it's, it's nice to see all these guys uh, be, you know, semi-healthy and, you know, who knows if, you know, Tristan Newton or Stefan Castle, you know, where they're going to go. Um, but for the women, I mean, what a, what a Cinderella story for them. Even, even to make it this far is incredible. Um, when you have that many injuries under Gino and you're that thin on your bench and you're running, like, I don't know, like I said, six to seven people. I mean, it, it's just incredible. I'm, I'm very proud of them. Just, just, what what a story, you know? Definitely. I want to shift gears to gambling and betting, um, an area of your expertise. Um, some controversy has arisen, especially in the world of basketball. And I'll speak for my friend Matt. Um, I think betting and gambling is very fascinating. We'll never partake in it, but I think it's really interesting. But I think a lot of people commenting on this are not fairly super knowledgeable about the gambling world, but you are. So I want to ask you specifically, are you concerned about kind of the Jonte Porter situation, um, prop bets in terms of college? Like, he kind of walk us through from just educating kind of the, the common sports fan why prop bets specifically are good or bad, or what other concerns you've seen within the gambling world, especially since there's the other states legalizing it in terms of kind of the sports betting. Are you seeing any concerns that are worrying you or do you think these are isolated incidents that it'll work itself out eventually? Um, you know, g- gambling goes back a-, a long way, but it's been legalized for what, like since 2018, 2019. Um, you know, I-, I always say this, everything comes with its pros and cons. Right. And the number one thing I will say is at Lisa Ball's Life Bets, we always try to teach, you know, smart betting. And there's a, I could go on a whole, you know, rabbit hole of this. But I I think with the whole Porter situation, it came to light because I believe it was what player props that he was, I think they were hitting like very small amounts, like 0.53 pointers or 0.5 assists. And there's a couple of games where he was not listed on the injury report and he was heading back to the locker room with like an illness or an injury. So because of those irregular betting patterns and the amount of funds that were being dumped into the, you know, betting the under for a certain situation, now you're really talking about, you know, just a whole other, I think probably the tip of the iceberg of some things that are happening in betting. And I don't think this is going to be the first you're going to hear of it. We heard about it with Pete Rose. And, you know, when it comes to player props, I know that the NCAA has been critical of them. And I, I think the number one thing to remember when betting is, yes, you need to bet responsibly, but we also have to remember these people are humans, right? They're humans. They're not a player prop. They're not a line. 
I mean, these people play, you know, whether it's for their college or professional, and nobody should be receiving death threats or anything like that. So I, I think betting legally, being the legal age, having a lot of regulations, and just teaching people if you're going to bet, don't bet beyond your means. So you're sending death threats. Don't I always say don't bet your mortgage. Um, you know, things like that. You need to be responsible. But I have seen, you know, some instances, especially with Porter, where, you know, there may have been some instances where he he knew about it and going back to the locker room, maybe to make some people money. It's never been certain and they never, you know, really came out and said, okay, you did this, but it's worth an investigation. And I think when it comes to betting, it's just about teaching people how to bet smart, res responsibly, be a good human being. And like anything uh, that's addictive, it's go it's going to have its pros and its cons. So with this, the, the game itself, because it, everybody's worried and paranoid about the integrity of the game specifically, do you think players, and really in all sports, you give up that fundamental right of gambling unless you're playing poker, you know, some kind of card game. But when it comes to sports, you lose that right. You should not be able to gamble at all. Do you do you believe in that, or do you think that's that's within the right to, to gamble as long as it's not you know rigging the outcome of their own sport? Are you talking about athletes or just in general? Um, athletes. So basically, if you, hey, let's say you're playing the NBA, you can't bet on any sports. Yeah. Period. But you can you know you go to Vegas. You want to play poker, cool. But if you want to gamble on sports, you cannot, and that's tracked once you get into the league. Do you believe in that, or do you think you know that's restrictive? No, I very much believe in that. I'm all about protecting the like. Obviously, I I work in betting, but I'm all about the integrity of the sport and doing it the right way and protecting the players to, to some degree. And I think if they were able to bet on games, like we've seen that with Calvin Ridley and you know Pete Rose, and you know you even have LeBron uh, advertising DraftKings, I I think it would just change. I think there would honestly be a lot of scandals in sports. I do. Um, I'm not saying that there hasn't been scandals already because we've seen that. But I, I just don't believe in in players who are actually playing the sport betting on a possible outcome. To me, that just takes away from just all the integrity of the sport. And uh, I would say leave it up to the people that, you know, know the sport, can intelligently bet, that don't have any ties to the sport whatsoever. Um, I think that would be a catastrophe <laughs> if they ever made that legal and would probably <laughs> ruin, ruin, ruin sports, <laughs> to be honest. I, I agree with that assessment, Sarah, and, and it is yeah. interesting because I think even given something like that, which I think is very easy if it's not already in players' contracts, I think it would pr be fairly easy in terms of protecting the brand of the NBA and other sports leagues, very easy to write that into players' contracts. I, I think they would even get buy-in from the the strong players' union that uh, the NBA has. Um, wanted to ask... It, in terms of going beyond that to maintain the integrity of the game, I mean, given the the incident with Porter, the speculation around that, it seems like that may be something where there's a little bit of responsibility on who is setting the prop bets. I mean, do you see any changes in, in trends with that coming down or is just the as long as there's money on the table, there's not really the incentive on that end of, of the bargain. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I only, we only deal with balls. I bets. We only deal with le legal sports books. Um, obviously there's offshore books and they do things illegally. And I don't, I do not mess with that. I don't believe in that. <laughs> sure. Um, but I think as far as that goes, I think there's with the increased betting, there's more, programs right and they're great programs to show the trends and where the money is going and i think what happened in porter's case is people saw the trends mm -hmm. i think that's what it was and a lot of the money was going into these props and that's kind of what manipulates the lines so it's not so much vegas you know setting these lines i mean maybe they picked up on it and said maybe we shouldn't put him in our player props at all because wow we're noticing an influx of everybody betting on porter under you know, 0.53 pointers. It's just like not a normal bet that you make. A normal bet's more like an everyday player, like a LeBron, you know, AD rebounds. Um, so when you see things like that, I think it's it's regulated, but again, it's going to come down to 
all of social media. On Twitter, you could literally type in somebody's name and say, what are the player props for tonight? 76% is betting on X, Y, and Z. So I really think there's just a lot of trendsetters out there, a lot of a lot of sharps out there, a lot of people that are just, just studying trends all day. And they picked up on it. You know, whether it was, you know, intentional or not, that's kind of just how the betting betting world goes. Do you think if the kind of the fire is found where the smoke is right now with Porter, if if what we're thinking may be true, will Adam Silver come down pretty hard on this? I mean, could you see something as extreme as like a lifetime ban from the NBA? Um, you know, given what you mentioned about keeping players away from the betting side of the game, do you think they may make an example out of him? Um, unfortunately, if that is the case, which would be very un- unfortunate because this is a guy that hasn't had a lot of NBA success and was in the G right. League and had a couple of injuries. He's not his brother. Let's put it that way. Right. That would be very terrible for him. And I'm not going to be accusatory. We have to go through the whole process. But for sure, I'd like to think that Adam Silver's a really, really great commissioner. Um, I do. Um, you know, minus the All Star game not working out in his favor. But, you know, I, I really do think he cares about the sport. And I do think he would hammer this down. And I, th- I do think it would be an example of what not to do in the NBA and what might maybe cost your career um, influencing and manipulating lines and betting. Um, that's really serious. And, and you're seeing a couple of examples um, of, unfortunately, some of the cons. I mean, there's so many pros to, to betting, but I think this would really set an example. And like we, like I said, P. Rose, I think he has like a well, lifelong ban, right? Or Correct. something like so, that. Yeah. yeah. So it would definitely, I think, send shockwaves across the NBA. And I, I don't get the sense that a lot of players do this just because I spend a lot of my time researching and studying the trends. But if, if they do find that, 100%, he would, I think he'd put the, the ban hammer on that. Do you believe in that? Do you think players deserve a second chance? Or do you think it's zero tolerance? When it, if he's found guilty, Jonathan Porter, if everything pans out, um, it's definitely associated. Yeah, listen, I believe everybody deserves a second chance in life. Uh, that's kind of how I've always been. Um, but however, when you're dealing with people's money earnings, yeah. um, people invest their money into betting. Um, you know, people uh, invest in general. There's something called the gambling debt. You know, they have to pay back the money. I mean, there's people that are putting their own life, extra their paycheck into this. And, it, and when it has to deal with integrity of the game, I... I just feel like there's no coming back from that. Um, I feel like when you're manipulating people and you're, like I said, I'm not being accusatory, but if there's a situation where he did know and he was purposely going back to the locker room, I mean, that's serious. And that gives betting a bad name. And working in betting, we hate that, right? We hate seeing the terrible things that happen. And I I strongly believe that these things come to fruition because you have to kind of weed them out, right? And we have to be aware of the bad things that can happen in this industry um, in addition to the good things. And a lot of people aren't really educated on, you know, betting as a whole. So yes, it will make the media, people will probably, you know, have a lot to say about it, but I think it's something that you can learn from. And I just can't see a player that's, you know, not really well, even if he was well-established, I mean, it's just very wrong, very wrong. Wanted to right. ask Sarah, we, we've we been, uh, you know, this gambling story is so big for the NBA and basketball and sports at large. I've, I wanted to spend some time on it, but I also want to ask you just with what you've seen and, and your experience researching betting and these types of things, it's, it's always kind of been the, I guess, stereotype or maybe cliche that, you know, Vegas always knows best. You can, you can learn a lot by looking at those lines with how much detail and information is out there now compared to like the nineties and early two thousands. Do you still feel like Vegas has kind of upped their game to stay at that cutting edge for all the info that they're putting and all the money that's riding on all these lines (laughs) has Vegas been able to, to keep up with the fire hose of information that's out there? I mean, yes and no. I mean, there's a lot of times where I'll research and I'll look at a prop uh, like last year, it was uh, Bruce Brown over 0.5 three-pointers. 
He was making them every single round, every single game of the NBA <laughs> playoffs. And the line stayed the same. And Vegas just was not changing it. And I want a lot of money off of that. I said, all right, Bruce Brown. Then he got his contract with the Pacers. Now he's gone. But, you know, going back to when I used to go to the casinos and horse racing, you know, you remember all the the, the sheets and stacks and manually searching. Now there's all of these tools, incredible tools. And guys, people are quitting their full-time jobs to create apps and tools to help people (laughs) bet smarter. I'm serious. And, you know, it has worked. I mean... Um, you know, I bet smart. I I never bet on something. I you know I have to watch it. I have to know what I'm betting on. But I would say it's it's changed dramatically. I mean, they didn't have graphs and stats and standard deviations. You know, of players. Uh, you know, what are they doing on one day's rest, or how do they perform on three days rest, or how do, how does Anthony Davis perform without LeBron James on a Monday? I mean, that's how intricate it's gotten. And I think it has helped people perform a little bit better. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's why it's kind of taken off. I think people have had a little bit more confidence in how they can can bet. And kind of back in the day, you kind of did your own research and just kind of put money on it, right? But um, it's it's really exploding. Like I said, I know so many people that are just quitting their jobs because they they want to help people develop a smarter tool or... You know, and and they all cost money. Uh, they're they're expensive, but it, for people that do this as an investment and not a hobby, it could be very beneficial. So lay out kind of the beginner's guide. So let's say yep. there's a viewer of this podcast. They want to get into betting on the NBA playoffs. Like there's so many CTs commercials, right? You see Jamie <laughs> Foxx, you see FanDuel, you see DraftKings. Yeah. It's just like very overwhelming. It's just like, how do I start? What do I do? Like what would be your best advice in just dipping their toes into the water and just kind of, you know, having fun and gambling responsibly for a beginner? Yeah. I mean, first of all, um, you know, when you start, you need to educate. And even at Bala's Life, if you go to ballslife.com slash betting, there are so many resources. What is legal in your state? You have to be a legal age. What are the legal sports books? What are the regulations? You must understand that, in my opinion, before even betting on any sport. I I think at the end of the day, also knowing that it can be addictive, like anything. um, You know, I remember as a kid in the 90s, there was, you know, Bud Light commercials everywhere over the Super Bowls and Marlboro signs when I went to Yankee Stadium, you know, and all of these things can be incredibly uh, addictive. And I think the number one thing before even diving into it is knowing where you're at, what state you're in, if it's legal. Number two, are you legal age? And number three, the, I mean, everything you see on a, on a betting, it has a hotline at the bottom, right? Um, you have to know your resources because along with anything, you can really develop an addiction if you don't bet smart. And that's what we do, Justin and Matt. We teach people to bet smart. We educate. This is exactly what we do because it can get out of hand, you know, $25, five times a week, it can add up. So we always tell people, you know, don't, you know, just be aware of what, what books you're using. And at the end of the day, know, know how much you're betting. Don't bet beyond your means. Set aside a fund, whether you're investment, whether you're borrowing the money. These are all things that people need to understand before they even touch a book. Is understanding how much do I have to bet? It, like if you go to the casino and you play blackjack, right? I'm only bringing a certain amount because I know if I bring endless amounts of money, I'm going to walk away and not be able to pay my mortgage, right? So it's being aware of how much you're willing to risk and don't bet more than your means. After that, I would say, you know, learn the books, do your research, learn what the lines are, learn what money line means. It's just kind of like educating yourself. There's a lot of educational tools out there and we're one of them. Sorry, that was kind of long winded. <laughs> no, that's great. Do you do you think there's been kind of a reputation on on basketball? And I know some of it's tied into like maybe Tim Donaghy stuff from the past or whatever. But but aside from that too, there there's always been the suggestion like don't bet on basketball. Like if if a team is a seven point favorite in a game, you know that's it's just so hard to predict. Do you? From what you're seeing, do you think basketball is one of the more volatile sports to bet on, generally speaking? Honestly, I love it. That just coming from me. 
Um, I think the NFL is one of the more volatile uh, oh. uh, sports. I'll be honest with you. I haven't had a lot of too much luck with that. Um, everyone's going to have their own opinion, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I think my favorite is the WNBA because they never move the lines. Mm-hmm. And betting has actually helped increase the WNBA. Um, even look at the Iowa LSU game. They said that was the most bet game out of any professional game that day. And I was like, that's right. That was wow. crazy. <laughs> Um, so I, I think at the end of the day for me, um, I tend to stay away from large spreads like eight to 10, 11 to 12. But again, it's about doing your own research. It's about really looking at the trends, looking at the teams, looking at the stats to make an informed decision. And I would never say, okay, the Celtics are 60 and 15. Let me just bet on the eight point spread. You know, it just, it doesn't happen like that. But the thing with basketball, it's a game of runs, right? It's a game of runs. There's a load management. There's a lot of times, yes, I've been burned if a player gets taken out, if it's like a blowout with the Washington Wizards or the Pistons, and that's when it can get volatile. I'm not going to lie. So um, you really need to understand your matchups. You know, Celtics, Wizards, is it going to be a blowout where Jason Tatum's going to be taken out in the third quarter and he doesn't get his 25 points? So it's all kind of things I look at. Uh, But as a whole, I think the NBA has been very good to me as far as betting goes. Um, but that is an example how it can get kind of volatile. And then when you get to the playoffs, it's it's the margin gets closer, right? Just like with March Madness. So you have people who are betting and they're new, betting on these really big events like Super Bowl, you know, NBA playoffs, March Madness. Probably you, you may end up losing your money because you really got to know the sport. You really have to know where your money's going. So I. Forgive me if this is not a, a question yep. you may be able to answer, but I'm curious because I follow combat sports too. And I'm just curious between team sports and more in combat sports where that's more in, individualistic. Do you see a difference there in terms of the volatility, in terms of the risk, or do you think it's the same? Um, what do you think in terms of kind of the rise of this mixed martial arts? And then you have, you know, with boxing going into like influencer boxing, you have just the regular fights too. Do you <laughs> see Jake kind Pauls. of, yeah, kind <laughs> of Mike Tyson. I'm yeah, not touching insane, that. insanity. Um, do you kind of see <laughs> like a difference with betting there? I realize research goes into every part of betting, but yeah. do you see like a difference between kind of those individual sports and the team sports as well? I mean, absolutely. I mean, I'm not a huge UFC better, to be honest. I mainly just kind of basketball. But I feel like with a team, there's a lot of different influences and factors that can influence a team where when it's just a, you know, let's just say Jake Paul and Mike Mike Tyson, right? Like, it's you against them, and that's it. I mean, whatever happens, happens. If you get (laughs) TKO, that's not, you know, like, I feel like it's totally different sides to betting. Um... And like I said, I feel like that's why the NFL is hard because there's so many varying factors in it, right? Whether, uh, you know, NBA, you have back-to-back. Some of your teammates don't want to pass. <laughs> Maybe, you know, Jokic isn't feeling great and doesn't want to pass on a Monday night. You know, I, I think they're just two different types of betting. And, um, you know, I can't say I have a lot of n- knowledge or even experience in UFC, but I- it's definitely on the rise. I can tell you that. Even in golf, things like golf, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. no, it, it's, it's it's yeah, it's just very crazy in terms of the integration NBA league mm. has incorporating just light bets as well. What do you think in terms of the viewer? Because I've interviewed some journalists, it kind of turns them off in terms of the seeing all the yeah. commercials. It does that if there's a betting kind of interfering with their viewing um, experience. But I mentioned. Adam, you mentioned Adam Silver earlier, and I think his vision is you know seeing a broadcast and having five different ways of viewing it do you see kind of the central broadcast always having some kind of betting component do you think do you want to see that in terms of like the main like kevin harlan or mike breen like bringing out the odds like are you cool if you're in now do you you rather see that like an like an alternate broadcast where you're watching the nba finals um well much to your point justin i think there's two kinds of people in sports people that hate betting people that love it and people are like all right it's all right but it's not for me for me, I work in betting, so I, I, I'm okay with it because I just, I'm around it 24-7. Um, you know, I, I think whether people like it or not, and I'm saying this is like a neutral thing, it's, it's the way of the future. Unless if it absolutely implodes and you're only going to see it on the rise. Um, sometimes do I think it could 
you know, sometimes take away from the broadcast. Yeah, I do. Um, sometimes it could just be a little bit too much. I, I think they need to still figure out what is a happy medium when it comes to the Super Bowl, like what, like a, a tasteful way of doing it. Um, sometimes I feel like the Super Bowl, it was kind of all about betting and then you kind of lose um, sight of what the game is, right? And kind of just the experience as a whole. So, you know, I, you know, whether people agree with it or not, I think it is the future. But again, it's, it's going to be finding a way to market it without like overkilling people. Um, because then it's just going to, everyone's going to be gambling, you know? And, uh, I, that's, I think that's my only downfall is just, I would say doing it tastefully, you know, like at the bottom, but like every commercial, it, it's a lot. It could be a lot. I can see that for sure. Um, let you go with this. Uh, we're <laughs> at the NBA headed towards the playoffs. Celtics very dominant within the Eastern Conference. Um, anything worrying you about particularly the Celtics? Heading, are they the favorite, you think, to win it all? Do you see any kind of teams? You know, we have like kind of some new faces in the mix with like the Magic and the Cavaliers. We heard today about Julius Randle. He's out for the rest of the season. Yeah. We don't know how that's going to affect the Knicks. Like, where do you see kind of the Celtics road? Do you think it's an easy path? The Bucks have been, you know, kind of up and down ever since Doc Rivers has become the coach. Like, do you, are you fairly confident or are you seeing some kind of uh, hurdles that other people are not seeing with the Celtics possibly becoming the champions this year? All right. Well, it's April 4th and I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I've covered this team extensively this year. And, you know, I thought we were great last year, but um, we changed a lot of things this year. And to get to 60 wins it is incredible. Um, however, however, um, you know, I, I saw what Denver did to us. And I've seen us have the challenges and the 15 losses that we've had. And we've only really had this new team with Porzingis and Drew Holiday for less than a season. So with the Eastern Conference, I think Julius Randle, um, I really thought the Knicks were going to be one of our biggest, biggest threats, if healthy. With Ananobi and Julius Randle, I really thought they were going to be. I think the Cavs, they've had some injuries. I just don't think they're there. Um, I'll, I'll say it, and I'll die in this hill. I, I still think the Miami Heat are always, always going to be there against us because they've they're beaten scary. us how many times. So, um, you know, the Bucks, I'm not sold on yet. I'm not sold on Doc Rivers. I was very skeptical of why they made that coaching change as good as they were. But I don't, nothing against Doc Rivers, but I think they're 14 and 13, right? With him or something. That's right. So I think in the East, my expectations is is to take that. But then again, we lost against the Hawks. What was it? Two games in a row. And that could be a possible play in, play in team. So I think for the Celtics, um, you know, the magic right there, the Pacers kind of fell off, 76ers fell off. We should have the East, but I, I think the team, I think it's going to be a West. It's like the wild, wild West out there. There's so many teams, uh, the Nuggets, uh, the Thunder, if they can get more size. Um, you know, there's just so many teams in the West that are kind of like a what if. But I, I do strongly believe the Nuggets are the team to beat until they prove otherwise. But I do feel the Celtics are at a better place and in position to hopefully, you know, get over the hump in the playoffs. And that's Missoula coming up with a plan, less iso ball, ball movement. And it's really going to come down to, can Jason Tatum lead this team? I mean, can, can we, if we live or die by the three, if we don't hit the three ball, can we create our actions? Can we you know, get to the rim. Is there other ways of scoring? You know, that's really going to be Celtics basketball. And that's what it's really going to come down to, honestly. Is it's, are we going to go into bad habits? You know, is Jalen Brown going to turn the ball over? Um, and, and it's really going to be, who's going to get past Jokic? Yeah. <laughs> it seems fair it's crazy to say, right I mean, it's probably going to be, I, I think people, even non-Celtics fans, pretty understanding if they can't get past the Nuggets. But it does seem like from what I'm seeing would be a pretty big disappointment if they're not in the NBA finals. Is that fair to say? Um, I think for Celtics fans, it would be, um, I mean, listen, getting to the NBA finals is hard, right? In any sure. sport. It's tough. So for, for me, it, it, it would be a win because it's like, all right, we're right there. Last year, Wick, the, the owner of the Celtics 
after that loss, he's like, we're dismantling the team. We're not coming back. With this team, they're heavily invested in not the, not just this year, but in years in the future. So for me, if we lost like the Nuggets, if we lost in the first couple of rounds, I'm not going to lie, that would be a disappointment. It would. Um, absolutely. Not, not at 60 wins. But if you get to the Nuggets and you can't beat them, it's like, all right, what do we need to do to get past Jokic? What do we need to do to beat Jamal Murray? Because we've seen him and Jokic are like the two best duos in the league. It's It would more be like, all right, we're going to run this back. We're going to win. And that's kind of how I see it because the Nuggets are good. <laughs> they got chemistry. For sure. um, and I hate to say it, but uh, they have, you know, the MV, probably the MVP. So I, I don't see it as, as a, like I said, as a disappointment. But if we do lose in the first couple of rounds, absolutely. For sure. Sarah, this has been a fantastic chat. Thank you again for Yeah, thank us. you guys so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem. Please let our audience know where they can find you on social media, whatever projects you have going on. And um, what else would you want our audience to know? Yeah, um, you can find me on social, Sarah Jane Gamelli on Twitter, Instagram, all the good stuff, YouTube, TikTok. Um, also heavily involved with Bola's Life uh, Women's Basketball and Bola's Life Bets. You can follow Bola's Life Bets on everywhere. And uh, we do a lot of educational stuff on there, ballslife.com slash betting. So we're looking to be leaders and hopefully changing uh, the industry and adding more uh, education to that. Awesome. Thanks again, Sarah. Thank you, Matt. And uh, thank you, Justin. Appreciate it.